Lucifer did not turn into Satan overnight. He didn't just have this thought like look in the mirror for the first time and say, man, I am good looking. <laughs> wow. Do you see this guy? Me. It was a gradual process. And it started with the thoughts. And then another thoughts. And then thoughts turned into words and words turned into actions. And it was a gradual process. Ricky? You know, uh, and, and this is more one of the most saddest things that God ever said, or Jesus ever said when he was on earth to Israel, when he walked out of the temple. And he said the same thing to Satan. He says, your house is left That's with you. Yes. Desolate. Mm. Okay, so Lucifer wanted to be like God. How could this created being who stood right in the very presence of God, he was a covering chair, he knew God better than the other angels knew God. And he said, I want to be like him. How can the created thing become like the creator? No one. There was something that he knew that would make him like God. Do you know what it is? It's what we're doing right now. And that is worship. And this is why this controversy is always centered around worship. Amen. Between the true and the false. Mm -hmm. Think about this. How would Satan become like God? Would he ever have the power to create? No. But if he could get beings to follow him and worship him, then he would be like God. He never wanted to overthrow God. He couldn't. He couldn't. He knew that at any time God could just speak the word and he would be gone. But he knew the character and the nature of God. And what the other angels didn't know, they didn't know the depths of the deceitfulness of sin. Again, Patriarchs and Prophets tells you, chapter 1, that even Lucifer didn't know the deceitfulness of his course. Because the Bible says that he was made perfect until iniquity was found in him. And as he continued on this path of transgression, iniquity became a living force inside of him. And he didn't even know where this was leading. And he didn't know the depths of the degradation that he would go. But he kept making willful choices and decisions that every time a red flag would come up, he would choose to ignore it, and he kept sinking deeper and deeper and deeper. And what he said is that if I could get the angels to follow me, and if I could win there, and then I could go to the worlds that God created and win them, then I would be like the Most High God, and they will worship me. Is Satan called a God? by a lot of people. Satan is called a God. Jesus said he was the God of this world. Right? Yeah. That's the only kind of... That's, that's what he wanted to be. He wanted to be like God. And he has achieved that in a certain way. And it comes down to worship. So listen. Look at where we live in 2016. Do you believe, I asked you this before, I'll ask you again. Do you believe you live in the last days? Yes. yes. Why? Just give me one reason. Okay. Hold up. Ma'am, say it loud. Iniquity. Okay, it's a good reason. Iniquity. There's always been sin, right? Okay. Apparently, it was worse when God flooded the earth because he looked down and said, this has to stop. He hasn't destroyed us yet, right? Yeah. Iniquity is one of them. Is there any other reason? Donald. Prophecy. Yeah. Prophecy. Oh, that's a good one, too. At some point, you can read prophecy, and if you understand it, you realize things are going to happen. The end is coming when you see these things happen, right? You see them happen? Okay. Right, what do you guys say? I was going to say prophecy, exactly. It's perfect. What amazes me is that there are people who don't even follow God who have said to me, man, we are living in the end of time. The world can't go on much longer because of how it's going. If you believe that the world is coming to its end and we're living in the last days, then is worshiping God the right way important to you? 
Don't you think that if worship was what caused this schism and this split in heaven, and worship is what got the first human being murdered by his own brother, and worship is what Jesus kept, I wouldn't say arguing, I would say trying to teach the Jewish leaders the truth of true worship, don't you think that's going to play a big part in the last day events? Yes. So if worship is a key um, what would be the word? Element. Element, thank you. A teacher, thank you. <laughs> if worship is a key element to the final days of Earth's history, and you say you're living in the final days of Earth's history, don't you think you better know what true worship is? Yes. Have any of you guys ever gone to any other Protestant denominations within the last year? Raise your hands. Okay. It's not many. There's some. Worship. Worship is going to be the focal point before Jesus comes back. And before that, worship is going to be a focal point within the churches about what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, what is right, what is wrong. Is there a right, a right way to approach God? Yes. Is there a way that pleases Him? Yes. Is there a way that pleases the devil? Yes. You better figure out what the two are. My job here is to make sure that what we do here is done in a way that pleases God. The Bible tells us to worship Him in the beauty of holiness. I've been to a lot of worship services where I had a hard time finding anything that was holy. And this is where we are today as a church. Now I'm talking about the entire Christian church. And that is we have lost sight of holiness. Holiness has become boring. And just, wow, your services are so dead. And, you know, I like this service because they have live music and they have, you know, a band there and the preacher really, tells really good stories and he's entertaining and they do skits and dramas and all this stuff. But what does God want? And that's the question you have to ask yourself. Does God want excitement or does God want your heart? What do you want? Do you want excitement? I'm not that exciting of a guy. <laughs> This is why it takes a lot of effort to put a hundred people in here and you can go to a church down the street and there will be 500 people there. You want excitement? You will find it there. You want truth? I hope you find it here. Because that's what I want. I want truth. If a little excitement is thrown in, hey, I'm good with that. But I want truth. And I want God to be pleased with what we do as worship. Um, turn with me to Exodus, well, you probably already know this, but turn real quick to Exodus chapter 20, verses 2 and 3, and we'll bring this to a close. Exodus 20, verses 2 and 3, what does it say? That's going to be the Ten Commandments. What's the first commandment? Why does God say, Thou shalt have no other gods before me? If you read the verse above that, God says, I brought you out of Egypt with a mighty hand. I am your creator and I am your savior. You shall have no other gods before me. Now, what commandment did Satan break when he said, I will be like the Most High God? That's right. He wanted to be like God. But you can't be like God because there's only one God. Okay, so turn again real quick. Uh, Ricky, can you turn to Psalm 145, verse 17? Ray, can you turn to Psalm 97, verse 2? Ricky, read yours first and then Ray. Then everybody else turn to Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4. 145. 145, verse 17. Everybody else turn to Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4. So, Ricky, do you have that? Yeah, my page is more. 
Well, he's looking. Can I tell him something? Yes. I love the picture that you painted for me about sin because you talked about how the devil didn't even realize where he was going and how this took on like a life of its own. It's like law of inertia. Things in motion yes. tend to stay in motion. motion. You know, it, and I see sin as like a fire. Yes. It's, it's, a consuming. Living, it's a living, breathing thing that takes on this. It, it's like what happened in Canada. I mean, all of Canada just... Yes. It's, it's crazy. Ricky, you have that text? And Ray, I got something to comment off of what you just said. 45, 17. Yes. The Lord is righteous in all his ways, gracious in all his works. So listen, I bring you to this text because I want you to think about how did God treat Lucifer when Lucifer rebelled against his maker and his creator? Did he just kick him right out of heaven? No. Why did it seem like he did nothing? Nothing. Now Lucifer, that's what he was thinking. God didn't do anything to me. So... I'm going to keep taking this further and further. Listen, I've asked you before, this has been a while, but we were talking about the sanctuary, and I asked you, when you sin, when you sin, is it an ethereal thing or is it a material thing? Or sin? It's material. Because it's, it, it is not a thing, it's material. Because when you sin, you have to confess your sin, and where does that sin go? Up into the sanctuary. Right? Where Jesus is ministering. And Jesus has to do something to get rid of that sin. Why? Because it's not ethereal, it's material. Something there. So, as you said, Ray, when iniquity was found in him, it took on a life of its own. Do you know why? It's because evil, iniquity, is the opposite of God, righteousness. If you step away from God and you're no longer controlled by Him. There is no other action except the opposite of who and what God is. Mm. And that's all the bad stuff that we deal with today. I, I, I don't mean to disagree with you, Pastor, but, but evil and all that is the absence of God, not the opposite of God. <laughs> you understand what he's saying? Because what he's saying is true. Yeah. <laughs> what I said, is that true or is that false? So, again, what we're talking about is, is looking at the same thing from two different sides. Because, again, fire. Can you have fire without oxygen? No. What is, what is the opposite of light? No. Who says this thing is darkness? The same thing as the light. The absence the so see what he's saying is true. Looking at it two so it's just looking at it from two different ways. There's no such thing as darkness because God is light. There's no darkness in him. It's just that darkness is the absence of light. So this is the perfect time for me to read my text. Go ahead, read your text. Clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. Okay, you all have Deuteronomy? Do you have it? Can you read it for me? Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4. He is the rock. His word is perfect. For, he, for all his ways of justice, without of truth and without the injustice, righteous and upright is he. What does that verse tell you about God? It says that everything he does is just and right. In his dealings with Lucifer, who became Satan, all of his dealings are just and right. You know what? I ran out of time. We'll continue this next week. So, listen. Do you guys know what Revelation chapter 12, the story there is about? Revelation chapter 12, verse 12. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. Something happened. War in heaven. War in heaven. We pick this up next week. That's what we'll look at. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 428. Can I ask you guys a favor? Can you stand up and everybody come to the front? We're going to have a choir. And you're the choir. So I don't want you in a fourth. I want everybody up in the front. Squeeze in because choirs have to get close together.
Come on, don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. Squeeze in together. Max is our choir leader. What number are we singing? We're two eight. We're two eight. What's, what's the name of it? Sweet by and by. In the sweet by and by.
So it will be in the melody when it says uh, by and by. you got in the suite by and by, and you see that bottom word by and by? Mm -hmm. So you want all the men with the deep voices doing which one? The, uh, the, by, the second. The second one. By by. Okay, you ready to try this? Are we starting to get the top? Or yeah, we're going to do the first dance again. Okay, here's bass. Amen. Amen. Thank you, God. I appreciate that. You were a great choir. Amen. 